Thank you for the introduction. So in the, in the last two talks of this session, you've seen um, some nice theory of gradual typing. And this talk is going to be about the practice of gradual typing. So the practice of gradual typing hinges on the gradual typing thesis. Now, imagine that you're a programmer who's just inherited a 10,000 line Python code base. And you need to add a new feature to this code base. And you're run, rummaging around in the code. And you're really wishing that the past programmers had put in type annotations that would have served as documentation so that you could actually refactor this program. That's the kind of developer that gradual typing is for. So the gradual typing thesis states that people write untyped code, and they write large programs uh, sometimes in these untyped languages. Second, static types help maintain software written in these languages. And so third, gradual type systems should let you add sound types in an incremental manner to your programs. And the types that you add to these programs should respect the existing code and so the result of, the, of gradually typing this program should be runnable. And so there are these four key words that are italicized on this slide. And these are the key points of gradual typing. And I want to focus on two of these in particular in this talk. And first, uh, sound types. So here at Popple, most of us can agree what it means for a static type system to be sound for uh, most statically typed languages. But what does it mean for a gradually typed language? Now, I know you've heard some of this in the past two talks. But I want to approach it from a programming perspective, from the perspective of a user. So let's say we have uh, this gradually typed program. Uh, and this is, a, this is a program that computes Popple's favorite function, the factorial function. Uh, and on the left-hand side of this program uh, is uh, a module written in typed racket, which is a gradually typed sister language to racket. Uh, and the left-hand module actually implements the factorial function and exports it to the right-hand module which is written in racket, which is untyped. Now, one thing about this left-hand module is that it's actually written in a hypothetical dialect of type racket that is unsound. And so when we actually run this combined program, what we find, oh, uh, I should mention one more thing. The right-hand module also calls this factorial function with a bad argument, with a string instead of an integer. So when we run this program, what happens is that we get this random runtime error that comes from somewhere in the bowels of this typed module. And that's not what we want to see. And it could be even worse. So in this case, because Racket is a safe language, it's a relatively benign error. But in general, you could have a nonsensical, uh, you could have nonsensical behavior or you know, even worse. So if you instead write this type module in a sound gradual type system, uh, like type bracket, then what you get is that when you have this export of the factorial function to the untyped code, you will instead install a protective contract that ensures that when you run the program, you'll get a contract error. And this error doesn't come from deep inside the runtime system. Instead, it tells you exactly where your program violated the type invariance. And it tells you what type was violated and where you can go to fix this problem. Of course, adding these checks uh, is a bit at odds with this other keyword in the gradual typing thesis, that the results of gradually typing your program are runnable. And there's implicitly a runnable well in this statement here. Uh, so what do we mean by that? Let's look at another example program. This is a prime number save program uh, from our benchmark suite in our paper. And both of the modules in this program are untyped for now. And when we run this program, it takes 12 milliseconds to run, which isn't too bad. But now if we take the same program, but we add type annotations to the left-hand module of this program, and we run it again, what we find that is it takes a lot longer, long enough that you're probably getting sick of waiting by now. Still waiting. And it takes about 10 times slower than the original program. And that's, that's pretty bad. And so a 10x slowdown could make this software undeliverable if we were actually a software team that was trying to build production software. Now the question is, are these slowdowns in gradual type systems actually a problem in practice? To figure that out, let's hear what the users have to say. So here are some anecdotes from actual users of Type Racket. Uh, and uh, these are messages from the Racket mailing list that users have actually posted 
In the first message, a user is complaining that when they added type annotations to their program, it became two times slower. In the second case, we have another user who's actually writing commercial software in, in Racket. Uh, they added type annotations to one-fifth of their program, and then the resulting program was 2.5 times slower. In the third case, uh, a user is trying to use a typed Racket library that defines some data structures that are interesting um, from an untyped uh, program. And when they tried to do that, they found that the contract overhead was 12,000 times what they expected. And that's comparing to the original, pro the, the original program they wrote, which was entirely typed. So there were no dynamic checks installed. So this sounds uh, pretty bad. And uh, to sum this up, here's a message from one of our users uh, who told us that as a practitioner, there are costs associated with using typed racket. Therefore, it has to provide equivalent performance improvements to be worthwhile at all. So this particular user is telling us that no overhead would have been acceptable for him to use type bracket. And indeed, this user has actually stopped using type bracket because it made their program too slow. So real users are telling us, the language designers, that gradual typing is too slow for them. Now, as language designers, we want to ask, why is it slow? Is it because these people are bad uh, programmers and they're writing bad programs? Is it because type racket has a poor implementation, or its design has issues? Or is this a fundamental issue with gradual typing? And in order to answer this, the first step that we need to go through is to come up with an evaluation method to actually see if our gradual type, uh, gradually typed programs are slow. That brings me to the contributions of our paper. First, we present an evaluation method for gradual typing language implementations. And this method is based on this idea of incrementally adding types from the gradual typing thesis. Second, we also have an idea for graphically summarizing the results of these evaluations. And finally, we also present the results of actually conducting an evaluation on the typed racket implementation using this method. So first, I want to start out with the key concepts behind this evaluation method. So as I said, the gradual typing thesis states that programmers add types incrementally. So your evaluation method should also do the same. And to see what we mean by this, let's look at uh, an example program. So this diagram is showing you the suffix tree benchmark that's from our benchmark suite in the paper. And it has six modules, each of which is um, identified with a box. And these boxes are in this pinkish color, which indicates that they're untyped. So what we can do is we can run this benchmark and see that it runs in some, num some number of milliseconds. And we'll call this the baseline performance of this program. And so we'll say that it's 1x uh, performance, 1x uh, runtime. Now what we can do is we can um, add type annotations to, the to these modules and uh, end up with a blue program, which means that each of the modules is typed. And what we see is that the performance is now 0.72x. Uh, which means that actually adding types sped up our program, which is kind of nice. And the reason it speeds up is because Type Racket has a type-driven optimizer. But remember that the point of gradual typing isn't to fully convert your program to a type program, at least not always. We want to be able to incrementally add types to our programs. So let's start over. Let's again go to this untyped program, and we'll say it's 1x again. And let's instead start by adding type annotations to a single module in this program. First, we'll add type annotations to this LCS module. And we find that now if we run this particular configuration, the runtime is now 4.4x the baseline, which is pretty bad. But the story gets even worse, actually. If you add type annotations to a single other module, the label module, then you get even worse performance at 90x the baseline. And if you keep doing this, you notice that actually the performance doesn't seem to be getting much better. And uh, one other thing you can notice is that I've drawn these gray lines in, uh, which connect configurations where uh, if you add uh, another typed module, sorry, there is a line between two configurations. If you add uh, another type module to the bottom one, then you can get to the top one, uh, like this one here. Uh, and if you follow these gray lines all the way up to the top, then you get to a fully typed program. And again, we've uh, recovered the overhead here. And if you zoom out from this picture, then what you see is a lattice. And what we, we call this the performance lattice. 
And the paths in this lattice are gradual migration paths that an actual programmer might take from a fully untyped program to a fully typed program. And one thing that I should note here is that the partial order in this lattice is only based on the uh, addition of types to a single module. It does not have to do with the performance of the programs. We only, we, uh, when we construct the lattice, we, we first construct the lattice, then annotate it with the actual uh, measurements that we make in each of the configurations. So you might ask, why is it interesting to look at all of these possible configurations and measure their runtime? Well, if you look at all of the configurations, then you can actually see what the cost of the boundaries in these benchmark programs are. And you can also get an idea of whether there are any good paths that a programmer might take to add types to their program. So on the boundaries thing, well, let's look at one particular example. If we go to the suffix tree program again and look at uh, two configurations, uh, both of which have the first two modules um, being in opposite colors, that means that either one of data or label is always typed and the other is untyped. And that means, uh, assuming that these modules are actually coupled, uh, which they are in this program, uh, then, the, uh, then there is a contract that's installed by type bracket between these two modules to ensure sound interaction. And because of this contract, we find that in both of these configurations, we have pretty bad performance overhead, uh, 75x and nearly 90x. So we can, we can conclude that this boundary is probably costly in this program. If we look at two other examples where instead the data and label modules are both either untyped or both typed, then we see that the performance is much better. It's about 13x and 9x. And so we can see that, uh, and, and what this tells us is that this boundary is particularly uh, costly and when we remove it, it's okay. One thing that I should note about these um, diagrams is that they don't show you the dependency structure uh, in the program. Um, in this case, data and label do actually depend on each other, but uh, the others aren't represented here. We have other diagrams in the paper that show you what the, the uh, dependency diagrams are in all of our benchmarks. Okay, so this visualization as a lattice has some limitations. So first of all, if you look at two particular lattices, I mentioned at the beginning, that this evaluation method is for language implementers. So if you have one version of your gradual typing runtime system, and then another version that you've maybe added some optimizations to, and you measure the performance of each of these configurations in Lattice, can you really tell which one is better? Uh, it's, it might be kind of hard. So instead, let's not look at the whole Lattice. Let's instead summarize by the proportion of deliverable configurations in this performance Lattice. And I put deliverable here in quotes here because it's a technical term. What deliverable means here um, is the following. A configuration in the lattice is n deliverable if its overhead factor compared to the baseline is less than or equal to nx. And we can fine tune this n parameter for the kind of situation that we want to talk about. So more concretely, let's look at the same lattice again, but colored a little differently. Let's suppose that you're willing to tolerate a 10% overhead in performance. And then let's look at the lattice. All of the black lattice nodes are ones that are not deliverable by our definition. And the bright green ones are the ones that are deliverable. And we see that only 6% of the nodes in this lattice are deliverable for this definition. Now, if you're willing to, uh, if you're willing to tolerate an even higher overhead, let's say a 3x overhead, the percentage of deliverable configurations doesn't go up very much, only 9%. Now instead you can imagine that you're willing to tolerate a 5x overhead and you're still not very good, it's 19%. And we can keep going with this, 22% for 10x, 38% for 20x, and even at a 20x overhead, uh, which would be completely unacceptable for most of our users, there are no paths from the bottom of this lattice to the top of the lattice where you always stay entirely green. So that's looking pretty bad. Now, you, might, you probably don't want to construct a lattice and color it for every possible uh, variation of this n parameter that you might have. So let's instead visualize this n deliverable parameter slightly differently with a CDF. That's a cumulative distribution function. When you do that, you end up with a chart that looks like this. 
First of all, the y-axis is the percentage of deliverable configurations in this benchmark. It goes from zero to 100%. And you can notice that the blue line doesn't actually uh, go all the way to 100% despite being a CDF. That's because we've capped the x-axis, which is the overhead at 20x. This program has overheads potentially much worse than 20x. Uh, so it goes off the chart. We chose 20x as just an arbitrary uh, uh, point. Uh, and this blue line is showing you uh, the particular number of deliverable configurations, sorry, the percentage of deliverable configurations for a particular overhead that you choose. So for example, if you uh, choose the three X overhead point on this, uh, you can see that the green line is showing you where that intersects with the blue line. Um, uh, and as I mentioned before, three X is about 6%, which you can see, uh, well, it's a bit hard to see this, but it's at 6%. If you're instead willing to tolerate, say, um, a 10x slowdown, you can see by going to the uh, 10x point on the x-axis that the blue line is at 20% there. Another thing you can see from this graph is that the slope of this blue line matters. So in particular, a sh relatively shallow slope like the one in this graph is not good for performance. And the reason is that that means that even if you're willing to tolerate greater and greater overheads, you don't quickly get more percentage of, the, of your configurations deliverable. In contrast, let me show you a graph for a different benchmark uh, that we measured. This is the Gregor benchmark, uh, which uh, is a date time library. And this CDF uh, shows a much steeper slope on the curve, which means that as you are willing to tolerate more overhead, you quickly get more, more and more of this uh, lattice as deliverable, which is good. And in particular, it only takes up to about um, 5x or 4x here to get nearly all of the configurations in your lattice deliverable. Uh, so basically, to summarize this, shallow slope is bad, steep slope is good. Um, now going back to this, um, these lattices, now if you look at these two lattices on the top and we're asked to compare them, it might be difficult. But if you instead look at two of these uh, end deliverable CDFs at the bottom, you can tell that on the left, there's a shallower slope and on the right, the slope moves further to the left. And so the left, the uh, program on the right, sorry, these are uh, two uh, implementations of uh, Racket running the same benchmark. The implementation on the right has a better performance overall because of the slope. To sum so to summarize the approach, what we do is we construct these performance lattices for all of the benchmarks in our benchmark suite. And when the lattices can be manually inspected, we'll look at them and see where the bad boundaries are in our program. And by using this end deliverable CDF as a summary of these lattices, we can compare the performance of different benchmarks and also different implementations. Now I'll talk about the actual results from our paper. And to do that, I wanna first talk about our benchmark setup a little bit. So what we did was we curated 12 benchmark programs uh, and we measured all of the configurations on all of these benchmarks. And these benchmarks, uh, five of them are user-written libraries and programs that are actually in use. Five of them are educational programs from things like blog posts and papers that may or may not be in use. Uh, and then two of the, of the programs were written particularly for this paper. And to run these benchmarks, we had to run a total of 75,884 different configurations uh, across all of our benchmarks. And in total, it took us three months to benchmark all of, this, all of these configurations. So it took a lot of work. Now, these are the end deliverable charts for all of these benchmarks. And uh, you may not be able to see all of them in, in close detail, so I just wanna summarize them. So you can see here that next to, uh, in the corner of each of these end deliverable charts, there's a percentage, and that's the three deliverable percentage. In other words, if you're willing to tolerate a 3x slowdown, this is the percentage of the configurations um, that are um, within that slowdown. And you can see that about half, uh, just a little over half of the benchmarks have less than 50% deliverable configurations at this 3x point. Now, uh, in the paper, you can look closely at these diagrams and, uh, and look at the details, but it might be hard to see uh, in this talk, so I'm gonna summarize this one more level. Let's instead look at the 
proportion of configurations across all of the benchmarks that are actually good. Now first, let's, let's uh, imagine that you're willing to tolerate a 10% overhead. Then we can look at the 10% or sorry, the 1.1 deliverable configurations across all of our benchmarks. And we find that we only have 283 out of 75,000 configurations that are deliverable, so that are under 10% overhead. That's 0.4% of all of our configurations. That's not, that doesn't look very good. If we're willing to up this to a 3x overhead, then we find that 8,000 configurations are now deliverable, so under 3x overhead. But that's still only 10.5% of all of the configurations of our programs. So if you imagine a gradual type programmer who's trying to add types to their program, chances are pretty high that they're going to end up in one of these bad configurations. So, this, so the bottom line here is that most of the configurations in our measurements were not deliverable, even with a liberal 3x uh, slowdown that we were willing to tolerate. So up to now, this talk has looked pretty uh, dismal in the sense that our performance numbers are looking very bad for type bracket and for gradual typing. So you might wonder, is there hope for gradual typing? And to answer that, I'd like to present some new results that we've come up with in the past few months uh, since the publication of our paper. And what this shows you is that, uh, first of all, in response to our paper, the Racket developers, which includes some of the authors of this paper, uh, went and tried to imp improve the performance of Racket and Type Racket between 6.2, which is the version that we use to measure all the benchmarks in our paper, and 6.4.04, which is the uh, new version of Racket that'll come out in the future. Uh, and this new version has a bunch of optimizations, both at the level of the gradual type system and at the level of the underlying Racket implementation, including things at the JIT level. And what you can see here is that if you just look at the three deliverable count, it goes from 9% to 19%. So 10% more configurations are now under 3x overhead when they weren't before. And if you look at the slopes of these curves, you can see that the new diagram has a slightly better curve. It's slightly steeper. And if we look at another program, this is the KCFA benchmark, again, we see that the slope has become much steeper. But if we look at the percentage at 3x, uh, the gains are more modest. But the point here is that we've made performance progress. And the nice thing about these charts is that they tell us how much we've improved by adding our optimizations. So because of that, we have some hope for gradual typing. Our first hope is that the, our evaluation method will help implementations and uh, language designers uh, to make their gradual type systems better. In particular, it will allow them to measure improvements between versions of their gradual type system by comparing this uh, CDF between one version and the next. You can also manually inspect the lattice and see where there are bad configurations to try to ferret out uh, what weaknesses your gradual typing system has. For example, uh, in our paper, we actually present profiling results uh, where we looked at the worst case configurations in our programs. And uh, we were able to identify certain features of the contract system that are costing us in our particular programs. The second hope that we have for gradual typing is uh, from a language user perspective. We, uh, we, might, we want to have tools that let us avoid gradual typing performance pitfalls. And as initial steps for this, Racket comes with a contract profiler, which actually tells you how much of your program runtime is spent using contracts. And we have some results in our paper that uses the contract profiler to give you some uh, information on what contracts are slow. Uh, and when you run this profiler, you get a readout like this that tells you, uh, for example, uh, that contracts may take 47% of your runtime or something like that. And that brings me to the end of my talk. Uh, so here at the bottom, there is a URL for our paper uh, and data sets that you can download. And thank you for listening. which I want to migrate.
-hmm. And I don't want to try the combinatorial number of combinations of all possible patterns in the lattice. Any recommendations what I should do and how should I proceed if I decide to do so? Uh, yes. So uh, there are a couple things you can do. So as I mentioned, we do have a contract profiler that lets you narrow down uh, where the overheads are coming from. That at least, that at least tells you which boundaries uh, might be causing the problem, so which should type to untype boundaries. Uh, in general, uh, our evaluation method is for language implementers rather than language users, so we don't yet have a tool that can help language users uh, navigate these uh, pitfalls. Hi, right, two questions. Um, first of all, to what extent do you think the performance results are specific to Racket and its implementation uh, versus uh, to what extent do they generalize to other kinds of gen gradual typing systems? And then second, um, I'm wondering whether it would be possible for, or whether you've thought about um, tools for um, programmers that might help them um, by automatically inserting uh, type specifications or removing them in order to increase the performance of their code. Hmm. Okay, um, so for the first question, um, whether the results generalize from type bracket. So our particular benchmark numbers may not generalize from type bracket, but we think that the evaluation method will generalize to other languages. And actually, that's a great question because I have a slide about it. Uh, so there are other research implementations of gradual typing. So if you look on this timeline, uh, there are at least four new gradual type, uh, type systems that have come out in the last few years. Um, and we'd like to challenge developers of other gradual type systems to try to adapt this method um, to your own gradual type system and, and see how it does. Uh, for your second question, um, I think that was um, whether uh, tool support um, and in uh, adding or removing type annotations could help, help the programmer. Um, let's see, so we haven't, uh, we haven't considered, um, so we haven't considered that particular tool, but we're, but what we're hoping uh, to develop our tools um, that can predict what boundaries in your program are problematic. Um, and in practice, um, that may pinpoint particular type annotations that you've added to your program, especially at uh, module imports and exports. Right, thanks. So I must say you're making unsound type racket sound pretty attractive. <laughs> it sounds to me as though if you use that, then you'll find some errors at compile time. Um, your performance presumably cannot be worse and may improve. And your error messages will be the same as you get from untyped racket. That is no worse. So that, that sounds like a fairly attractive combination, which suggests to me that I might like to uh, run using unsound type bracket most of the time, and if a test fails, or some, if something fails in production, rerun it with sound type bracket. Is that possible? Uh, okay, so from a user perspective, it might sound attractive, uh, and because of that, uh, so uh, there are a couple things. Uh, first of all, uh, Sound gradual typing gives you, the, gives you the benefits of having more debugability. In particular, it tells you which contract, uh, which type interface was violated. That, you wouldn't get that if you just had your typical untyped runtime errors. So that's one thing. Uh, the second thing is that type bracket does come with some escape hatches so that if you really want to eke out performance, you can, you can choose to use those performance, um, to use those unsafe hatches. Um, the third answer is that as language designers, um, it's more interesting for us if we try to do the hardest thing, which is to make sound gradual typing work fast. So another idea that right. um, occurs to me is I wonder whether you could, for example, perform every 100th contract check mm. and in that way often detect when something has gone wrong, mm -hmm. but then rerun with all of the checks. Mm. And if you're facing 100x slowdown, then running the program twice, once with and without mm -hmm. checking is it's virtually free. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's an interesting idea. Yeah. All right, hi. Uh, hi. That was a very nice talk. I enjoyed it a lot. Um, I do wonder if you're maybe actually presenting a picture that is too sunny. Um, so, <laughs> so let me explain. Uh, you know, you have these CDFs and you say you have, you know, like a three deliverable overhead or so on, but as you pointed out in the beginning of your talk, or early in your talk, uh, there may not actually be feasible paths to get through that percentage. So you say, well, it's 20%, but in fact that may be zero. So do you have numbers or can you characterize how many of these things at various deliverability levels are actually feasible? 
so very yeah, few in of terms these. Of paths, yes. <laughs> so what we found is that very few of these paths are feasible. Uh, we don't actually have numbers for that in the paper, but we have looked into this a little bit um, after the publication. Okay. So what's very few? Uh, let's see. So for suffix tree, it's actually zero, like I said. Uh, for the other ones, I don't have numbers off the top of my head. Okay. okay. All right. Thanks. Yeah. This is a very nice talk, and I'm looking forward to using this evaluation methodology. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe this is more of a, a comment than a question, mm -hmm. but a key design decision in the implementation of type track is to use contracts. And that's mm -hmm. a beautiful design decision from a um, you know, sort of theory point of view. But the contract system is super general. It's way more than what you need for uh, a gradual system. And so, and you pay performance-wise. Mm -hmm. And so I think a really important you know, piece of future work is understanding how, you know, what are we paying in terms of performance for contracts versus sort of the minimal of what you need. So you know, I'm looking forward, and we're doing some research as well into like, if we've got a minimalistic implementation of CAS, mm -hmm. what's, what's the overhead there? Mm -hmm. Yes, Thank I agree. You. That'd be interesting. Yep. <laughs> Congratulations on the most beautiful slides I've seen at Popple so far. And people often put attention into them, so well done. Thank you. Um, I don't buy any of this. <laughs> <laughs> right, you've, you've given this number of three. Oh, I can't afford more than a slowdown of three. Very often I can afford a slow, you know, your first example was Civ of Rastasines, which ran in 12 milliseconds. And my 100 times slowdown meant 10 seconds. Oh dear, I can wait 10 seconds, right? So very often, this is all going to be fine. Only a populist would say that. <laughs> <laughs> very, I mean, I think this does point out that if you're really mm -hmm. concerned about efficiency, this approach to gradual typing may not be for you. But then if you were really concerned about efficiency, would you really start by writing in JavaScript? Right, this, this is yeah. not clear. So. I, the other way of looking at this, right, is, oh, this stuff runs really slow. Mm -hmm. This means lots of opportunities to speed it up. Yay. <laughs> right, good for us. Uh, so for us, the answer is that uh, we actually have a production implementation of gradual typing, that's type bracket, that uh, people use. And our users are telling us that a 2x slowdown is unacceptable. So regardless of what us language designers here at Popple might think, we do actually, uh, we, do, we care about solving these performance overheads. Right, so which proportion of your users tell you that? Sorry? Which proportion? You were giving us proportions of things. Which proportion of your users? <laughs> so we haven't done a user survey about that, but we've gotten many reports. Uh, right, so at least some users' performance is really important for. Fair enough. I believe that. Okay. Uh, I'll just finish by saying there's this thing called the law of journalism. If an article begins with a question, the answer to the question is no. <laughs> <laughs>